How can we manage mutability in a multi-threaded world? Welcome back to the Hello World Show. I'm Heather Downey. I'm Spencer Schneidenbach. And we are here with the great Kevlin Henney. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about your background. Um, oh, background. Uh, I work for myself. I'm an independent uh, consultant, trainer, writer, all of these things. Uh, my interest is in code. Code, software architecture, people in the code, practices. Um, making things better, I think, is the big picture. Yeah. And uh, I was the editor of... 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, and co-authored um, a couple of books on pattern-oriented software architecture. Very nice. So what are you going to teach us today in five minutes? Um, I'm going to talk about the synchronization quadrant, um, which is uh, an idea related to uh, concurrency um, and mutability and locking. Um, so that, I think I should be able to convince you of um, uh, staying outside the synchronization quadrant. Very nice. Okay. So... To understand what the problem is, let's start off with a flow, a flow of stuff, perhaps a flow of traffic. If you can see, there's kind of windows in the background, and outside there is London traffic. Um, and so things are happening. We're, we're doing things, and it, it's, it's lovely. Maybe this is a, a sequence of instructions, a sequence of tasks that you're trying to achieve. All is good. There's a beautiful sequence here. And that is the operative word, sequence. It is sequential. Uh, there are no problems. The code is exactly as you expect it, barring Meltdown Inspector. But the code is exactly as you expect it. It's doing one thing at a time in the way that you described it. There is no surprise. Um, somebody tells you you have many cores on your machine. And uh, the programming language that you have gives out these little gifts called threads. And you think, this is great. I'm going to do this stuff because everybody's into threads. So you then decide, we are going to do multiple things at the same time. And this is all good. So that's fantastic. We've got two lanes of traffic here, two sequences. Everything works absolutely brilliantly until, until we need to cross the streams. <laughs> now, if you, know, if you know Ghostbusters, you know this is a thing not to do. So I'm going to introduce an intersection here. And so now we have potentially a problem. Because we have the potential for conflict. Um, we have what we can refer to as a critical region. This becomes critical. And, you know, I'm going to pick on traffic for a moment, because traffic, if you imagine you are crossing two streams of traffic, yes, critical is the right word. Uh, you are going to need some kind of protocol of negotiation, whether you're talking uh, roundabouts, uh, traffic lights, uh, four-way stops, whatever it is, you need some model of stopping, some model of yielding, so that you do not uh, conflict. This, if this space is effectively a resource, a shared resource. Uh, you cannot both use it at the same time. Um, so. This becomes our problem, our problem to solve. We have these critical regions. Now, th what people normally do when they look at this is they go immediately, yes, I need a, a, a yield model of some kind, a four-way stop, a, traffic, uh, a traffic light, whatever. And you think, brilliant, and we have a word for this. It's called a lock. Marvelous. And this is where we introduce the synchronization. And you, as a developer, are invited to do this. And you're invited by your programming language. You are invited by your libraries. You, maybe there are uh, primitives called mutexes. Maybe your language, if it's Java, you've got synchronized. If it's C sharp, you've got lock. It's embedded right in the language. There's an invitation. Come on, do this. Okay? This is how you're going to keep things safe. And I want to convince you that this is really not the right way to go. Um, and I want, I want you to be safe, of course, when crossing the road. But I'm going to say this is not the right way to do go Because there is an association here. In people's heads, they start off with concurrency. And they think concurrency must mean threads. And then they say, if we've got threads, it must mean locks. It must mean particularly explicit synchronization. I, the programmer, must control this and make sure that people do not crash, or to be precise, that we don't get contention on a resource, we don't get race conditions, and so on. It turns out the world is a bigger place. Um, threads. Ah, you know, you've got async I.O. You've got processes. Threads are not the only game in town. 
But I also want to say that this is the wrong way of thinking it because about it, because what is a lock? A lock is the anti-thread. Okay? Its purpose is to eliminate concurrency. The whole purpose of this is to prevent and restrict concurrency. And it turns out one of the great truths, and indeed, if you could see beyond this window at the variety of cars slowing down in the traffic, you would see that the really expensive, super large engine cars stop at exactly the same speed as all the really old slow cars. It turns out that all computers wait at the same speed, no matter what the gigahertz rate. This is what you are doing. You are stopping. You are eliminating the concurrency. So let's understand the quadrant. Let us understand what the issue is. There is an implicit assumption that we've made that we haven't, we haven't revealed. So let's reveal it. It actually turns out that it's OK to share state in a threaded program. Um, but there are conditions. So let's look at that state. So there is a thing you wish to change. It's an object. It has a setter, or it has some other method that modifies state. Okay. What we're saying is that state is modifiable. It is mutable. But we can also have objects that are immutable. They provide you with no operations that allow you to change the state. You will always see the same object with the same state. Once created, that object is effectively eternal and immortally the thing that was created. So we have a very simple view. And I, I'm going to say that this is not so much a range um, as, a, as a binary view. Okay? It's mutable or immutable. OK, so where's the quadrant come in? There's another aspect here. And this is to do with whether or not that state is shared. And we have shared and we have unshared. And what I mean by unshared is not that the state cannot be all over the place at different times. It's that at a given point in time, is that state, is that object, is that data being shared simultaneously between two threads? Is, that, is, is it or is it not? Or is it exclusively owned? And it turns out that the whole desire for locking is all about this quadrant here. If you have state that can be modified and simultaneously shared between threads, then you have a problem. This is where the locks happen. Okay. This is the synchronization quadrant. Uh, feel free to replace that S with a Z if it makes you more comfortable, <laughs> or a Z if it makes you even more comfortable. Um, this is where the locks happen. Okay. This is the quadrant of pain, to put it another way, because it's the quadrant of complexity. These are actually surprisingly easy, and it's worth understanding the underlying assumption here. If I've got state, and it is a thread accesses it, and it never shares it with another thread at all, ever, then it is clearly unshared. Its mutability is irrelevant. In the privacy of its own space, it can do what it wants. Okay, That's absolutely fine. I can also have state, I can have an object that is at any given point in time only um, uh, handled by one thread. And that's, that's perfectly OK. I can have this. I can work on it. I can change its state. And then I can hand it off to something like a queue. Now, of course, the queue does have locks, but they're not mine. I don't have to lock it. It's not my job. It's actually Im <laughs> it's incredibly hard for me to get this wrong. I'm not given custody of the key. I can't mess this up. I can't lose the key. So we have an idea here that in the unshared space, I can actually move things between threads and still not need locks for them and still guarantee safety. So in the unshared space, at any given point in time, an object is owned, if you like, by, by zero or one threads. <coughs> and we have the other axis here, immutable. If you can't change it, you don't need to synchronize it. What does the word synchronization refer to? It refers to synchronization of change, but that's a bit of a mouthful, so we never say it. We are locking against change. We are synchronizing change. If there is no change, we are already synchronized, or there is nothing to synchronize, depending on your philosophical uh, outlook. So what we're saying here is that three quarters of the programming world is actually surprisingly simple, and yet we are drawn to this. We are drawn to this particular quadrant, partly for historical reasons, our language, um, our languages and our libraries have grown up in, uh, with a mindset and a world that used to be unshared and assumes that changing state is a fundamental concept. Whereas wh what we're looking at here is more a world based on flow, a, ba a world based on true encapsulation, where actually this, is, this really is my data. It's not just a private modifier keeping it private. It's, no, it's in my thread. You never get to see it. Um, so what we've got here is a lock 
a lockless zone, uh, a space it w that will scale, a space that is simple to program, but it looks very different to the procedural view of we have single threadedness, now let's add threads. And that is the pain and is mostly based on assumptions and programming styles. So hopefully that has convinced you that, or at least it's illustrated the landscape of how to reason about this stuff. Uh, you don't need locks, you need a different mindset. Some code needs locks, that's the code here. Legacy code may necessarily be in the space and you may want to work out how to migrate it out. Uh, you may find that there are frameworks that help you, um, but it starts with the thinking tools. And when you're creating new things, just challenge yourself a little and say, could I make my life easier and more scalable? Oh, thank you so much. Do you have any questions for me? Well, you know, I mean, uh, nothing, nothing really a question wise, but it really is, I've, I've kind of lived in this world for a little while. I think when I learned, I started with C sharp and when I learned F sharp, I really learned the power of immutable state yeah. and not having to change things. So this, this really speaks to me. Yeah. 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 But it is also, I think that idea is that it turns out it's even richer. It's that idea of immutability or I, you can't see it. So it doesn't matter whether or not it's mutable. So it's a, it's an interesting idea that we can end up with the same uh, concept uh, 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 from a different dimension and that if you like the F sharp world gives us that, that dimension yes um, but if you go back and look at classic um, uh, Unix processes they give you this dimension uh, hmm. Unix is uh, based you know th it's philosophically it's it's C but uh, its model of concurrency is process based it's pipes um, and C is very much a language that says there is I can change things but if it's hidden behind a process boundary and so, so in other words, those two points of view already told us that, th that the world is a very large place. And you've got F-sharp to C, which you'd say is, is really, these are very incompatible worldviews. Yes. And yet, it turns out they have something in common. Um, and uh, we've somehow missed that fact that there's quite a broad space outside this. I appreciate you breaking it down for us. Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Hey, good. You want to check to see if, yes, if they're I good? We're going to take a picture, and then Phil is next. Yep. That was great. Thank you, Catherine. Oh, it's my pleasure. Tell us what questions you have for our guests. See, see you, you next time. time.